All right, good morning, everyone. Let's all, is everybody uh, uh, caffeinated, as Howard likes to say? We got all our, our uh, Starbucks people came on time this morning, so I'm happy to see that. So as usual, um, welcome to Grand Rounds for the month of uh, September. Thanks all for being here, both in person and online. Um, but as we do usually with these events, I'm going to start with a couple kudos. Uh, Dr. Chansky is not here to MC the deal since he's, I believe, out of the country this this week. Um, first kudos is for uh, Casey Peak. Um, she and uh, actually, I think this is Casey Peak and Pooja Pravakar. Uh, one of the nurses uh, said, um, "I would like to commend." Um, Casey Peak and Pooja Pravakar, uh, or I guess this is mainly for Pooja. She is stellar. She's been great to work with this month. She is visible on the floor, always willing to listen, and has uh, amazing, uh, or is an amazing team player with the nurses. Um, she goes on to cite a specific example where there was quite a bit of chaos overnight with a patient, uh, respiratory issues, uh, patient needed to go down to CT, and Pooja. I guess, navigated this very well. So this is one of our nurses on the floor uh, on our uh, trauma service at Harborview. So uh, thank you, Pooja, for your excellent care. Uh, the next one is for uh, Dr. Jacob Wilkerson. Um, here's the comment reads, um, a sunny Saturday in Seattle, okay, very literary, is a recipe for a busy ortho day and it did not disappoint. Jake did an amazing job. He remained kind and approachable despite the tremendous amount of work he had ahead of him. He was wonderful to families and provided excellent care. Uh, as charge, it was especially helpful that he would collaborate with the sedation uh, docs, uh, ED residents, and myself to formulate a plan to safely sedate uh, patients uh, in the most efficient manner possible. So this is one of our char charge nurses in the ED um, who was um, complimenting Dr. Wilkerson. So thank you, Dr. Wilkerson. Uh, for that, and then I think, uh, let's see, this is a longer one, too. Uh, for, again, I think Dr., uh, uh, this is Dr. Tatesman and Dr. Prabhakar, so Pooja again, and the staff of 6 uh, East, is that is that the trauma ward up on? Okay, sorry, I'm not super familiar with Harborview's inpatient setup. Uh, they, see, they spoke uh, not only about the excellent medical care, so this is one of our um, patient care relations uh, summing up the situation, I guess this family thought that Dr. Tatesman and Dr. Prabhakar did a great job uh, summing up the medical or discussing medical care, talking to the family. Um, they remembered their names specifically, and they wanted to say that uh, they felt very well cared for. So thank you to you both. Uh, so great. Always good to get kudos. Thanks, all of you, for the excellent care that you provide, obviously early on in the year is challenging with new faces and new trainees and things, but it looks like some of our new trainees are already making um, solid impact, so that's great. Uh, so let's get on with uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, welcome again to September Grand Rounds. Thank you all for being here. I think we have a very kind of appropriate, and as uh, Dr. Smith said this morning, timely topic here that I think affects all of us here in orthopedics and I think probably all of medicine. Um, uh, and a discussion about the obes ob uh, excuse me, obesity epidemic. And I think we're going to talk specifically how it impacts orthopedics, but I know we have uh, uh, Dr. Jackie Dunahoe, our resident, to kind of lead it off. And then we have, uh, I don't know exactly the order, but I think Dr. Judy Chen is here from our general surgery um, service to also talk about uh, surgical management of uh, obesity. And then Dr. Uh, Navin Fernando, our partner uh, in uh, arthroplasty, is going to talk about the implications for joint replacement. So thank you all for being here. And Jackie, why don't you lead us off? Thanks, Dr. G. Um, so I'll be, we'll be talking about, as a grant, as Dr. G said, the obesity epidemic and the implications for orthopedic surgeries and the current trends in management. Uh, appropriate topic for today, because today, today is National Eat an Extra Dessert Day. Uh, <laughs> I have no disclosures. We'll start off by just reviewing kind of the, what's going on in trends in uh, obesity, and then I'll talk about the impact on kind of orthopedic surgery. Dr. Fernando will talk to us about the direct anterior approach and uh, the implications of obesity in that, and then Dr. Chen will talk to us about management of obesity. So 
Uh, obesity, we all have heard of the BMI, which is body mass index. It's based on the weight uh, over height. Uh, obesity is defined as a BMI of over 30. Uh, overweight is defined as over 25 kilograms per meter squared. So since 1975, across the world, obesity has tripled in numbers. So the rate of obesity has tripled since 1975. As you can see, many countries in the dark blue in 2016 are reaching over 35% of their population is, uh, overweight, uh, is obese. So that's 1.9 billion adults over 18 are considered overweight. That's 650 million of those are considered obese. That's 13 of the world's population is considered obese. If you look across the world, there's now more people who are obese than people who are underweight. And there's more mortality related to obesity than the underweight uh, mortalities that we hear about. The only place that that's an exception is in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Looking at the United States, the obesity rate in the United States has continued to climb. Uh, these are data from the CDC, uh, a, survey they, a survey they do. And this is just uh, population-based reporting by, by uh, individuals on their height and weight used to calculate the BMI. And as you can see, we've been trending up since 2000, with now almost 40% of uh, patients being obese, 40% uh, of adults in the United States being over obese. Uh, oh, Middle-aged adults tend to have the highest rate of obesity as well as Hispanics and African Americans compared to Asians or uh, Caucasians in the United States. Obesity uh, is seen at higher rates in patients that are, have lower education uh, and decreases as the education of that individual increases. We also find that it's associated with patient, it's seen in patients that have a lower socioeconomic status. <coughs> Obesity <clears throat> has a high cost to us uh, in the medical community. It cost $147 billion in 2008. And obese patients back in 2008 uh, had an associated cost of almost uh, $1,400 more per year than those with a normal body weight. So when we have an obese patient, we know there's a lot of medical comorbidities that come along and are associated with obesity, stroke, premature death, diabetes, sleep apnea, pulmonary dysfunction. The list is really long of things that can be associated with obesity. These, all of these conditions add additional risks and complications to trying to take care of these patients from an orthopedic perspective. But these aren't the only issues that obesity leads to. Obesity itself also creates higher risks of complication and makes management of them, management of patients with orthopedic issues more difficult without the added complications of these medical comorbidities that are associated with obesity. So when you have a patient with, uh, that's considered obese, so BMI over 30, the physical exam alone and just seeing them in clinic is more limited. Bony landmarks can be obscured. It can be difficult to do our physical exam maneuvers when patients have really large extremities. It makes evaluating them more difficult. And then so we rely sometimes more on imaging to try and get past their physical exam limitations, but our imaging is also limited. Uh, x-rays are more difficult to get. Uh, the quality of the x-ray can often be poor. And the patients have to have a higher dose of radiation in order to get adequate penetration to get us an x-ray that's uh, useful for us in evaluating them. Because of the soft tissue envelope and the distance from uh, the x-ray, there is decreased accuracy of the radiographic me measurements. And actually, in patients that are obese, there was a study that showed that uh, there's a significant change in the leg length between supine imaging and standing imaging. Um, and so that's just one more thing that uh, imaging can be difficult. And then if we're having a hard time seeing with x-ray alone, a lot of times we'd rely on maybe MRI or CT, or we're using those to further look at uh, pathology, and that can be difficult if the patient uh, needs special MRI or CT equipment because of their size or weight. Once we've evaluated them, we've decided that this patient deserves surgery. Um, they have a lot of risks that make them higher risk for the operating room. Intubation for them is more difficult. Anesthesia, anesthesia has a harder time ventilating them with their pulmonary function and the increased resistance in their airway. So a lot of times we would like to rely on regional anesthesia because that decreases the risk of, the general, of anesthesia for them. However, 
regional anesthesia is also difficult, and studies have shown that uh, the effectiveness of regional anesthesia is not as high in obese patients, and we think this is because it's really hard to get the, uh, the local anesthetic in the appropriate location due to their larger soft tissue envelope. Again, difficult to find bony landmarks and identifying your anatomy uh, when they're trying to do the regional anesthesia. When you're positioning them in the operating room, they have actually an increased risk of positioning associated injuries. So scalp alopecia occurs at a higher rate in patients that are obese. They have a higher rate of, receiving, of uh, developing pressure sores. Uh, I, I personally thought, you know, larger soft tissue envelope, those bony promises aren't as bony and prominent, but they actually have a higher rate of developing wounds over those areas after an OR uh, case. They also have a higher rate of developing compartment syndrome related to the lithotomy position compared to normal weight individuals. They also just have an, a baseline increased risk of upper and lower extremity DVTs um, and are more likely to have one intraoperatively than their uh, normal weight counterparts. Managing them postoperatively, uh, I think we talk a lot about they have increased wound complications, um, not just infection, but also they can have slower healing time. Uh, part of this is thought that it may be related to the increased peripheral vascular resistance at the level of the skin because their heart has so far to pump the blood to that skin surface. They also have a much higher rate of infection. Um, and the literature differs depending on what subspecialty you look at and what orthopedic surgery they're ongoing. But generally, we talk about them having a higher rate of infection postoperatively. Again, they have the increased risk of DVTs. So managing these patients postoperatively, it's really important, one, that we're evaluating them. Do they have other risk factors for DVTs? But also making sure that they're on a weight-appropriate DVT prophylaxis if they are the higher risk, because they do require different dosing than your normal weight individuals. They also have an increased risk of hospital stay, whether that's after a fracture or after surgery. Um, part of that is they have higher rates of complications related to surgery. Um, they also have a harder time being compliant and functioning if we say they're non-weight-bearing on one side or whatever restrictions we put on them. They have a harder time managing those things, which can lead to them having to stay in the hospital longer to be able to get home or to the next, a safe discharge plan. Uh, so <clears throat> in relation to bone density, it was previously thought that uh, increased weight uh, such as obesity would actually be protective of osteoporosis, and these patients wouldn't be as likely to develop osteoporosis. But the newer evidence shows that obesity actually is associated with uh, a higher increase in bone density compared to age-matched normal body weight individuals. If you're overweight, there does seem to be some increase in bone density in the overweight category, but as soon as you kind of get into more of the obese, then your bone mineral density is not increased, um, and it's actually decreased compared to age matched population. Why this is is a little bit unclear still. They think, we think that it may be related to some inflammation, the, inflammational, uh, the inflammation associated with obesity, metabolic changes, hormonal changes. Um, there's a lot of research that's being done right now, but it's not really clear what the exact cause of why these patients have a decreased bone mineral density compared to their age-matched counterparts. Interestingly, in fragility fractures, they tend to have a slightly different pattern of fragility fractures. They have a lower rate of hip fractures, but they have a higher rate of ankle, vertebral, and humeral fractures, as well as uh, wrist fractures. When they do get a hip, hip fracture, they also tend to have intertrochanteric fractures rather than the femoral neck fracture that we see in normal weight individuals. In the trauma setting, uh, obese patients have a higher rate of mortality in, uh, when they're involved in high velocity injury uh, mechanisms. They also are more likely to have a traumatic injury than a normal weight individual. Uh, a overweight individual is, has an odds ratio of 15 uh, in, compared to a normal weight individual of having an orthopedic injury. And a patient with a BMI of over 40 has a 48%, 48 odds ratio compared to a normal individual of having an orthopedic injury. Um, fractures that they do have are often, they can be uh, complicated intraarticular fractures. They often have more pelvic ring fractures, distal femur fractures, ankle and calcaneal fractures when they are involved in a high velocity uh, uh, mechanism. They also have an increased rate of morale lavalle lesions with the increased shearing forces with that large soft tissue envelope. They also are at risk of these low energy mechanisms that result in a high energy fracture pattern that we don't see in uh, normal weight individuals. So they can have knee dislocations 
For example, I believe I saw a patient at Harborview had a knee dislocation after stepping off a curb and just twisting their knee. They just have a, their body weight alone creates that higher energy, even though it sounds like in a low energy pattern. This also is why they tend to have more intraarticular comminuted fractures that are complicated related to a low energy mechanism that we don't usually associate with that type of fracture pattern. We do see that in obese patients. Uh, looking at some of the other areas, uh, patients that uh, are obese tend to have a higher rate of injuries from repetitive activities. It's thought that in the upper extremity, this is thought that it may be related to the fact that their mechanics of shoulder, elbow, and wrist are slightly different because of the added weight of their arm and changes in the range of motion. But they seem to develop higher rates of uh, uh, rotator cuff tendonitis, tendonitis. They also have increased rate of carpal tunnel syndrome, though their carpal tunnel syndrome will often be uh, uh, will not have changes on the electro, uh, EMG. Um, in the spine uh, literature, they have, there's this association with possible increase in back pain in patients that are obese. However, obesity doesn't seem to be as well correlated with back pain as the other aspects of obesity, such as uh, lower education and socio socioeconomic status seem to have a better predictor of whether or not someone's at high risk for developing back pain. Obesity alone doesn't seem to be an indicator on its own. It's controversial There's on what the effect of obesity is on the lumbar disc. Some studies have shown that it may be protect, protective against uh, lumbar disc herniation, and others have shown that these patients have a higher rate of lumbar disc herniation that requires surgery. In sports uh, literature, there's a higher rate of meniscal tears in obese patients. Again, they have the increased rate of uh, rotator cuff tendonitis. Um, and then another aspect for sports is just that their portals can be difficult in accessing parts of the joint can be really difficult due to that large soft tissue envelope, similar to how ortho, uh, open surgery can be difficult just because of that large soft tissue envelope. In the arthroplasty world, um, there's a lot of literature that talks about the increased need for hip and knee arthroplasty in patients that are overweight. There's a Canadian joint registry uh, that looked at patients that went on to get a total knee and those that did not and age matched them. Patients with a BMI of over 30 are 8.5 times higher to get to need a total knee. If they have a BMI of over 35, they're 18.7 times higher, like, have a higher likelihood of needing a total knee. And if their BMI is over 40, it's uh, 32 times more likely to need a total knee. When they do have their hip or knee surgery, they also tend to be 10 years younger than patients that have a normal weight. So they're getting their more likely to need a total, total knee or total hip, and they're coming when they're a lot younger. <coughs> we know that there's uh, wound complication issues with these, and um, as I talked about before, the risk of healing. They also have a higher rate of infection. If you look at the infection rate, uh, one study had an infection rate of 0.5% in normal weight individuals. In obese patients, that was 5%, and in obese patients that also had diabetes, the infection rate was 10%. So that added uh, risk of diabetes did significantly increase the infection rate. They also have a higher rate of revision. So look, a couple of retrospective reviews looked at patients that are under pri primary uh, total hip, and those patients were more likely, if they were overweight, to need uh, revision of their acetabular component for acetabular loosening than their normal weight individuals. So obesity has a large effect in all areas of orthopedic surgery. Um, and other surgeries as well. Um, Dr. Fernando is gonna to talk to us a little bit more about the implications of obesity in uh, the direct anterior approach. Um, my name is Matt Fernando. I'm an assistant professor in the university. I'm a torio and surgeon at Northwest Hospital. My talk today is entitled Direct Anterior Approach in the Patient with Obesity, a story about love, deception, greed, lust, and unbridled enthusiasm. It's a very specific Seinfeld reference, so I'm hopeful somebody in the audience got this, otherwise the next 15 minutes are going to be very awkward. I have no disclosures to report. I may have a conflict in that I have been accused, I imagine, on several occasions of drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak. I have unbridled enthusiasm myself, I would argue, about the benefits of the direct interior approach. I believe there are some. Um, so despite that, I assure you I've tried to approach this talk from an objective perspective and fairly unbiased one. Um, assuming that the anterior approach isn't already somehow infinitely better than all other alternative techniques. Um, I also may have a conflict in that I suspect I'm one of the highest volume referring providers to the UW uh, Weight Loss Clinic, Weight Loss Management Clinic. 
uh, given the nature of my practice. Uh, Dr. Chen is here, I thank her for her attendance. My wife is actually also joining this clinic in October, so that may raise some eyebrows about my referral pattern as well, but I'll assure you that um, that is purely coincidental. All right, so onto the content. Total hip arthroplasty, I think we can say in 2019, is certainly the gold standard for um, the definitive treatment of degenerative oste osteoarthritis of the hip. We have over 40 years of experience with total arthroplasty. Multiple studies have suggested that the survivorship is greater than 90% in 25 years. Studies also evaluating uh, risk-benefit analyses have suggested that in comparison to any other major, major, major surgical procedure, quality of life years offered is greater than any other uh, procedure uh, currently offered. This article in The Lancet, published by Cecil Rohrbeck, who is a very famous uh, Canadian orthopedic surgeon, outlines the evolution of total arthroplasty and describes how we got to where we are today. So it's certainly an interesting read. Um, clearly, despite that, total arthroplasty has some problems. Uh, this article published by Kevin Bosick and colleagues in 20, 2009, looking at the national inpatients uh, sample, suggested that uh, reasons for revision currently today include uh, instability, um, as well as dislocation, uh, accounting for about 22.5%. A mechanical loosening, 19.7%, and infection, about 14.8%. Uh, so certainly despite the success we've seen in total joint replacement, there are complications and problems that we must address. One of my fellowships, uh, one of my mentors and uh, fellowship, Dr. Uh, Dick Rothman, who passed away last year, offered multiple words of wisdom throughout uh, the year that I spent with him, but certainly one of the um, words they left with us was when evaluating new technology, uh, certainly when developing new technology, first ask yourself, what problem are you trying to solve? And it sounds like um, obvious advice, but it's often overlooked, and, and certainly I consider it uh, sage. So in that context, when we look at the revision data, the problems that we are trying to solve in orthoplasty today are dislocation, mechanical loosening, and infection. So as it pertains to mechanical loosening, we certainly have seen some advances in total lip replacement. Most of these have focused on technology and the uh, bearing surface from the conventional polyethylene that was used in the 1960s by Dr. John Charnley, with evolution including highly crossing polyethylene, ceramic on ceramic bearing surfaces, metal on metal bearing surfaces. Certainly dislocation rate has been shown to decrease in some respects with newer technologies including hip resurfacing, modular total lip arthroplasty, and dual mobility bearing surfaces. <laughs> So unfortunately, in these circumstances, progress has not entirely resulted in progress. Uh, clearly, over the last 10 years in particular, multiple complications have been seen with these bearing surfaces, uh, including but not limited to ceramic on ceramic fractures, adverse tissue reactions, second like metal debris, uh, trunnion fractures as seen here, trunnionosis, intraprosthetic dislocations, which have been seen in dual mobility uh, bearing surfaces. So understandably, the enthusiasm for advances in technology have been tempered recently by poor results. But like good orthopedic surgeons, we have not lost our enthusiasm entirely, although it's transitioned somewhat from technology. So a lot of the advances, so to speak, in arthroplasty today have focused more so on technique, the goal of which in some respects is to facilitate rapid recovery, uh, rapid discharge, and outpatient surgery, which um, certainly may be the next forefront of, of total joint replacement. Some of these techniques include many posterior, two incision MIS, Watson-Jones, superior approach, and the direct anterior approach, which uh, I think in many respects has taken a significant foothold and has gained um, arguably permanent traction. So the question Dr. Rothman and we should all be asking in, in, in many ways is what problem is direct anterior approach trying to solve? That's a good question. Certainly uh, there are some advantages that have been reported with anterior approach, which we'll talk about in, in more detail, but some of these have included a decreased dislocation rate, a more rapid recovery, less pain, and theoretically better function. In some ways, this is an extraordinary claim in that we already know that the baseline success of total hip arthroplasty is extraordinarily high, 95% plus. So to determine a small difference or improvement with one approach versus the other actually requires extraordinary evidence, as, as Sagan uh, was known to say. So what evidence exists in 2019? The New York Times isn't exactly evidence, but this is perhaps where the attention uh, began. Uh, this article in 2013 um, reports uh, less pain, well, fewer complications, at least by the proponents of this uh, technique. The patient outlined in this article uh, described feeling like he never had surgery. In some ways, this is 
pressured us as orthopedic surgeons to uh, find a new gold standard on what our, our patients expect with this major operation. Um, certainly, internet promotion of the direct anterior approach is significant. This um, survey of AUKUS members in 2018 looked at almost 2,000 surgeons. 22.8 of these surgeons referenced the direct anterior approach on their websites. About 50% of these patients described it as less invasive with a quicker recovery. 28% decreased pain, decreased hospital stay. Um, the least of that, which was mentioned, was a decreased dislocation rate. Less than 5% of surgeons on these websites described complications which may be increased in the direct anterior approach, uh, LFSN injuries, stroke enteric fractures, wound complications, and only 3.6% of these surgeons referenced peer-reviewed literature to support their claims. The trends appear to be clear. This article in 2019, uh, also surveying AUKUS members, suggested in 2018 the incidence that is currently used by these surgeons at least is 40% for the anterior approach which is a 28% uh, increase in, in less than 10 years. Conversely, the posterior approach has seen a decrease uh, of about 20% in the exact same time period. So what advantages do exist and what evidence do we have? So evaluating dislocation rate, my interpretation certainly of the majority of the literature is that anterior approach likely has a decreased dislocation rate in comparison to non-direct anterior approaches. These three large studies from the Rothman Group, uh, another from the Nor Norwegian Arthroplasty <coughs> Registry, and the Kaiser Permanente Group, suggests at least that the relative risk of a dislocation is roughly twice that for posterior lateral approach in comparison to a uh, direct anterior approach. What about pain and function? I would also uh, suggest, at least based on the majority of the literature, that this is likely improved in comparison to either a posterior lateral approach or a direct lateral approach. These are also three large meta-analyses looking at multiple studies, looking at 90-day outcomes, looking at one-year outcomes, and evalu evaluating gait analyses, all of which suggest at least that there's some superiority with a direct anterior approach at these time points. Certainly, I would also suggest that past these time points, past one year in particular, is very hard to distinguish uh, clinical differences between patients regardless of the approach. So some disadvantages obviously also have been described by um, surgeons who are still advocates for the direct anterior approach. Certainly the operative time, blood loss potentially within that increased operative time has uh, been shown particularly in the learning curve. Specialized equipment is often necessary um, depending on your training, but a hand -a table and other positioning tables often if not typically are used by direct anterior surgeons. This necessitates in many cases the use of fluoroscopy in order to appropriately implant, um, uh, appropriately position implants. This increases the radiation both to patients and surgeons. And certainly there may be some approach uh, specific complications that we see in the direct anterior uh, technique. Nerve injuries certainly have been described, femoral nerve injuries due to hyperextension of the leg, LFCN injuries as I mentioned briefly. Fractures have been described with increased frequency of both the greater trochanter as well as the cortical perforations with femoral preparation. And then wound complications and infection which are but I'll focus on a little bit more in this talk. And reminding you that the three main problems that we're trying to address really today in orthopedics are dislocation, mechanical loosing, and infection. So how does the anterior approach, um, um, what are the implications of anterior approach on these uh, problems? So wound complications specifically, is the problem obvious? It seems like it should be in that clearly the location of the incision is very close to the abdomen. Certainly in a patient who is obese or a patient who is a panis, particularly when standing, this results in increased skin tension, which is not a favorable environment for wound healing. The location obviously also results in a moist environment, which is favorable for bacterial proliferation, proliferation which also can impede wound healing. And given the anterolateral nature of the incision on the proximal thigh, this is largely oblique to Langer's lines, which we also know can affect cosmesis as well as potentially delay wound healing. But is there more to this problem that we recognize? We know that normal wound healing has four predictable phases. One is hemostasis, where vasoconstrictive cytokines allow for platelet aggregation. Two is the inflammatory phase, where macrophages and neutrophils engulf bacteria and cellular debris. Three is the proliferative phase, where angiogenesis and collagen synthesis occur. And then lastly, four with tissue remodeling, where um, collagen and vascular tissue mature. We know that obesity independently may affect wound healing. Um, adipose tissue in of itself is relatively hypervascular. Adipose uh, tissue hypertrophies uh, clearly in obesity, and that results in a relative decrease in the vascular volume. This decrease in angiogenesis results in relative hypo hypoxia to the tissue bed, 
This may result in metabolic dysfunction of adipocytes, resulting in increased inflammatory mediators. This prolongs this phase and prevents progression to the proliferative phase. So therefore, collagen synthesis is decreased. Clearly, less vascular supply also affects the immune cell response, which can affect potentially infection risks. And objectively, there are decreased macro and micronutrients to this area, which could, again, further delay wound healing. So ultimately, on a physiological level, obesity as a, as a disease can be thought as an independent risk factor for late healing and potentially increase uh, the rate of surgical infections. So the question also arises as to whether or not body mass or body mass index is the best way to measure obesity. This has been, I would say, largely ignored by the orthopedic community, but uh, certainly in the obesity literature, other metrics and other measures have been described. So body fat percentage, which we're more familiar with, the waist-hip ratio, waist circumference, and even advanced imaging like MRI and DEXA scans to evaluate muscle composition and to evaluate um, uh, fat composition have been shown to potentially be a bit better measures uh, for important healthcare outcomes. Uh, the case in point is of a patient that I recently operated on who is 56, 5'5", 191 pounds, and technically, although certainly overweight, is not obese. But you can see radiologically, um, her panis lies below certainly the level of the hip. So clearly, despite objectively this patient not being uh, obese, this is certainly someone that is at risk for wound healing and unfortunately is currently being followed at the wound care clinic. Uh, so what does the literature show? Watts in 2016 looked at 3,000 roughly posterior lateral approaches versus 700 direct anterior approaches, similar demographics. Reoperation rates are actually similar for these two groups, but the anterior group, the reoperations were significantly more prominent for wound revisions and, uh, um, and infection. They demonstrated that morbid obesity greater than 40 represented a hazard ratio of 18 um, times that of the normal population. Female sex also was almost eight times hazard risk uh, compared to, again, a standard um, control. Uh, they demonstrated that age, operative time, surgeon experience, other measures, including diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis, were not predictive. Uh, John, also in uh, 2016, Journal of Arthroplasty, demonstrated an 11.5% rate of requiring an additional intervention. So not all of these were reoperations, but may have involved repeat visits to the clinic, may have involved uh, wound care referrals. Um, so a fairly high rate. Oh, and again, 2% of those patients requiring a reoperation. Again, BMI greater than 40 and diabetes were associated with, as independent risks. And they suggested that the optimal cutoff to prevent wound complications and direct anterior approach was less than 28, which is obviously an ambitious target. Uh, certain what happened there. Um, so this is an article by Christensen that's uh, overlapping, I apologize. But in this uh, article, they uh, looked at patients who were both of, under, uh, of normal body habitus and, mod and, and normal body weight. In fact, the direct anterior group had a BMI of 26, which, is, which was lower than that of the posterior lateral group. And despite that, they uh, showed that patients in the direct anterior group had a, at least a statistically higher risk of wound complications. And again, this article in 2011 uh, suggested that surgeons uh, should be cautious about adopting new technology and new techniques without long-term uh, follow-up. Uh, and recently, this article um, in Bone and Joint, looking at uh, New York experience, suggested at least, although the absolute rate of infection was low for both the posterior lateral group as well as the direct anterior group, the anterior group had roughly two times more likely uh, incidence of deep parasitic joint infection, also suggesting that BMI greater than 35 and diabetes uh, were independent risk factors across groups. Um, but again, there is some controversy in literature. These are a large registry and in institutional studies which suggest between anterior approach and non-DA approach, there may be no difference. So my experience is roughly 700 uh, direct anterior hips. Uh, wound complications certainly uh, are not infrequent. Reoperations have been 2.4%, which uh, is similar to other published studies. Average BMI of those patients requiring reoperation has been 346 uh, acute postoperative PGIs in this, com in this uh, group, 1.2%. Uh, Again, average BMI of those patients is 32. And then chronic parapsetic joint infections, thankfully, still uh, fairly low, about half of 1%. So lessons learned, uh, perhaps not enough, but this talk certainly has allowed me to reflect on my own practice. But I do believe that the advantages are likely real. 
and I also believe the disadvantages are likely real of this approach compared to other um, traditional approaches. I think it's important to be enthusiastic, and I maintain my enthusiasm for this approach, but I think it should be and has to be tempered by the evidence. Patients certainly have a choice. The risks and benefits have to be made clear and explicit to them. The surgeons also have a choice, and I think we should be uh, able to make decisions for our patients when we feel like the risk outweighs the potential benefit for them. In future directions, potentially evaluating within orthopedics alternative modes of evaluating obesity and nutrition. Uh, modified incisions, bikini technique in particular, has been described uh, by Martin Lunig in uh, Switzerland and, and has um, some merit in that the incisions distal to the abdominal crease. Um, and then the potential role of negative pressure wound therapy, at least at patients who are at risk. All right, thank you for your attention. Good morning. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Judy Chen. I am a bariatric surgeon. Did my training in Boston, but from Seattle, so happy to be here again. Um, I've actually been here for the last six years, not specifically at the University of Washington. And today, uh, with my portion of the talk, um, I'm going to discuss the treatment of obesity. Uh, I have no disclosures, but again, um, I guess what I really wanted to focus on is that often obesity is not someone that kind of focus, a, a patient, providers, they don't truly kind of look at that as the disease. It's still relatively new. Only in 2017 did the AMA really describe obesity as a true disease state. And so there's a lot of um, challenges in, in looking for treatment here. But really, um, often patients have um, another disease or condition that they need to treat, and that's where they get their referrals to manage their obesity. And so it's a bridge to somewhere, and it depends on kind of the ultimate uh, reason why somebody wants their obesity treated. Is it something that is short-term, where they need to get to a transplant state, or is it long-term, where they have to manage metabolic conditions such as diabetes? Uh, the offering um, in gem management is very limited, um, especially in medical management. There's um, not very um, good options so far, and it's still quite an evolving discipline. Bariatric surgery has been around since the 60s and 70s, but it, there's definitely been um, an evolution of that as well, which I'll go into. So um, Dr. Donahue did a really fantastic job in regards to um, some of the epidemiology regarding obesity. Uh, but really, it's a disease state with multiple pathophysiological aspects that really require a range of interventions to, to have advanced treatment and prevention, really. Uh, it's a crisis. It has far-reaching implications, as I think we've, we've discussed this morning. And the, the picture of um, obesity um, in the world and the uh, um, United States is, is not pretty, as we can see clearly. Um, over 70% of the population is overweight. Um, we've talked about class one obesity, which is a BMI of 30, where we're, we're hitting 40% um, of all adult Americans, and a lot of money is spent. And so um, uh, we had the global picture this morning. Here's a few pictures from CDC. And what's interesting, I think, is that um, just look at the colors and the scale at the bottom. So when this was being tracked in the 1980s, um, you know, we had no data then. 1995, we can see um, the colors are a nice pale blue, and it gets darker, and then yellow, and then red. Um, I didn't show every single year, but basically um, it gets really dark red. Sorry, they didn't come out as supposed to be dark red, but... Basically, it was this past year in 2016 where the scales, you can't get any darker red. So they actually had to change the colors. So it looks like it's better, but it's not. So, so um, basically, the dark red is the orange, and then they've, they've moved past, and blue is completely off the, off the scales. So that's that, again, reflection of greater than 40% of class one um, obesity, BMI of 30. And I think the history of obesity is a challenge. Um, I think we all grew up maybe thinking Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Well, clearly diet, um, I think, and the education around that has changed 
We can't talk about obesity without addressing diet, but as we can see, the headlines continuously change um, over time. So what is the appropriate thing to eat? What's the real headline here? And it's clear that it's not just what we eat, it's how much we eat, how fast we eat it, the mindfulness, understanding um, things about cues about satiety, hunger. Uh, it's not as simple as calorie intake as well. You know, uh, there's changes in lifestyle that can be a part of the big picture. But can we just blame our environment? Is it because, you know, we're no longer walking? Um, this is a... Uh, graph that shows uh, how much calories are each country taking in. So in the United States, on average, an adult is taking in over 3,700 calories daily. Um, and so it basically shows, you know, the caloric consumption of the, um, of the of country. But the key thing is that it doesn't match obesity. So Yes, the U.S. does top at caloric intake and as well as obesity, but as you look at the other countries, just because Italy is third in caloric intake, they are not at all on the scale for obesity. So it's not pure calorie intake, um, and there's, there's a, a very complex picture. And unfortunately, we often blame it on just diet and exercise, and that's the initial management is diet and exercise. So... Um, if we don't understand the pathophysiology, how can we treat this disease? It's, it's often, let's, let's get you to stop eating those calories and we'll get you out moving, and then you'll lose weight, right? So that's the usual first line of attempt in regards to uh, treatment. And um, again, as we mentioned before, there are many pieces of this puzzle that are still being evaluated in research and literature. It is unclear exactly what is the most leading cause of why obesity is prevalent. Uh, it's multifactorial. There's many genetics, <clears throat> neurobehaviors, hormones, endocrine, inflammatory factors that really um, uh, are part of this disease. And it's very difficult to manage it because we don't know exactly why a person may have more likelihood of obesity. And, you know, even um, what we're exposed to um, at, in the utero, in, in utero setting, so um, pre-gestational, um, all those different, different environments influence how obesity is manifested. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> there are a lot of positive, negative feedbacks in the neurological pathways. We know that... Um, People who have night shifts are multiple times more likely to have obesity because of that neurological circadian rhythm as well as the hunger appetite rhythm is all in that same part of the hypothalamus. And so it is, is not just pure calories in, calories out. And I think what's challenging for this patient population is um, there's, 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 there's very difficult conversations about this. Um, this, this is just one of those little cartoons that helps us remember that, yes, we do know that there are risk factors that lead to maybe surgical complications, uh, but patients sometimes are still dealing with that pain, uh, the discomfort, the risk of uh, metabolic diseases, and they, they are said, you know, I can't offer you treatment because your risk is too high, and they leave many physicians' office without getting their ultimate um, concerns addressed. We know for a fact that more women <clears throat> are unlikely to get routine pap smears because of their weight. Uh, there's routine um, health maintenance that are um, often uh, not addressed because there's discrimination um, and bias. And so there's a lot of implicit bias in regards to the attitudes towards uh, patients with excess weight. And so it's, it's a challenge because, you know, um, it, the patients often are faulted for being lazy, sloppy, and really there's many patients who are leading a healthy, active lives but continue to have metabolic disturbances. So as I mentioned before, treatment options are fairly limited. There's a lot of gaps, unfortunately, and it's, it's improving but very slowly. Uh, the gaps are not only in the technology, the advancement, but in access to care. 
over 50% of um, patients do not, who qualify for surgery actually do not have insurance coverage. Even if we do see patients in the weight loss clinic, uh, if they don't have any other metabolic diseases such as diabetes, insurance will not pay for weight management because again, obesity as ICD-10 code by itself doesn't allow that patient to get um, care. Uh, if someone needs nutrition under Medicare, they have to have diabetes or end-stage renal disease to get nutrition coverage. If they have obesity, they have to pay out of pocket for any diabetic, or excuse me, any dietitian um, recommendation. So there is a huge amount of barriers for patients. Um, behavioral therapy, as I mentioned, is important, but uh, that is usually the first line treatment. Uh, pharmacotherapy is very, very limited. There's a, there's a few side effects that we talk to patients about that. But really, pharmacotherapy gets patients to a weight loss of 5%, 5% of their total body weight. Um, there are newer ones, such as the injectable GLP-1s, uh, that can get people to maybe 8%, but those cost $1,200 a month for these these injectable weight loss medications. Um, and then as you get between the BMI 30, um, you, you don't qualify for surgery, which again is the most sustained and effective way of treating obesity, but um, you, you have a lot of gaps, unfortunately, here. Um, bariatric surgery is the most effective treatment for obesity. It is clearly something that allows for patients to have weight maintenance and sustained weight loss. And as we discussed before, huge amount of other medical diseases improve. Migraines, heart disease, diabetes, uh, fatty liver disease. Women can be more fertile if their polycystic ovarian syndrome is addressed with surgery. Um, and so there's a clear reduction in mortality with bariatric surgery because it does not just affect someone's weight. It's a metabolic surgery. It changes uh, the hormonal and, um, and uh, satiety um, effects afterwards. And just to kind of, again, hit home the expectations for patients, and I think people taking care of anybody with obesity is, you know, we often um, have patients and we say, well, okay, let's take, this is just that body mass index kind of in a color format. And if you take an average male who's 5'9", who has a BMI of 40, they are approximately 270 pounds. So as we know, that BMI of 40 can be a challenge if you're considering any sort of surgical intervention, other things. And so you, you refer them, and you want them to get a BMI of 35, so they have to lose 45 pounds to, to reach potentially another intervention, such as, a, again, a transplant or other um, things that are associated with obesity. How long is that going to take for a patient? What do they need to do? to understand are they going to get themselves into. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, medical behavioral therapy is about 5%. Unfortunately, um, it's often um, uh, not sustained because uh, as we ask our body to lose weight, all of the metabolic rates really force it back up. But in general, a safe weight loss is about half a pound to one pound a week. So this person has to uh, try to lose um, 45 pounds. Uh, medical management, as I mentioned, the, the range is between 5 and 8 percent. So over four months, they're looking at probably about 13, 14 pounds. But really continuing that rate is very challenging, especially if they have any sort of limitations. For surgery, um, this is after surgery. There's a time period um, as someone's moving toward bariatric surgery. But after surgery, for gastric bypass, we can see that third a third of total body weight, which is about 80 pounds, and the sleeve gastrectomy is about 67 pounds. So that's the difference between the options for these patients, and there's really nothing um, in between. Approaching patients um, about their obesity it is a challenge. Sometimes patients are not ready to, to come to that point where they think that this is something they need to address. Um, often, uh, it's important to think about when I see patients, is this something that they're interested in changing? What are the factors that might be leading to it? Um, are there ways and strategies that they can fit into their lives? Because many times there's a lot of limitations to types of foods, um, ability for activity, and barriers. 
And as I mentioned before, um, even with medications, there's criteria in regards to who can have medications. So um, uh, the guidelines for medications for prescribing is a class one obesity. If you have a lower class, which is a BMI 25, you need to have that comorbid medical condition, um, such as the diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obstructive sleep apnea, um, to, again, allow for insurance coverage. And not, again, not every insurance has coverage. Uh, you look at to see what the patient's other medical um, conditions are. Are there things that can be changed that already lead? And what's a challenge, too, is that um, if patients are placed on many of these medications after treatment, such as if someone undergoes a bariatric surgery and they're on um, you know, antidepressant, their, their weight loss is blunted. And so this is a continuous change um, to potentially their, their, their overall sustained weight loss. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on all the individual medications, but in general, there are very few. The, the, the safest is Orlistat, which basically decreases fat absorption. But as you may tell, if you're not going to absorb your fat, it has to come out somewhere. So patients do not like the side effects of Orlistat because you have the foul-smelling um, uh, diarrhea as well as flatulence and things like that. The next cheapest is fentermine. Um, it's an appetite suppressant, but it's not good for anybody who has any cardiovascular disease or anxiety. So there's a lot of limitations there. The newer ones, uh, which are combination drugs, such as Qsimia and Contrave, um, are very good. They have, again, appetite suppressant um, properties, but um, Qsimia is, um, is half fentermine, half tomperamate, and those um, can sometimes, again, lead to those uh, cardiovascular, um, hypertension, um, anxiety, as well as um, if someone is on Qsimia, they may not have um, tolerate it due to other side effects, such as metallic tasting, um, sometimes depression, and things like that. So there's a lot of different things that go into medications. But like all medications, once someone stops, weight comes back. So weight loss, again, really has a very poor follow through. Because when someone loses weight, they say, OK, I'm going to stop whatever diet I'm on because I lost the weight, because I'm going to keep it off. They're not changing their true metabolic factors that drove them to that higher obese weight in the first place. Same with medications. Most of the studies with medications, the longest is usually between six months to a year, but rarely a year. And many, many, many providers, doctors, um, and patients do not want to continue that after a year. So again, we're not seeing that sustained weight loss. Um, but those are the options for medical management. Surgical criteria. Uh, so if a patient has a BMI greater than 40, they could meet guidelines. Uh, if they have a lower BMI, it would be um, a BMI of 35 with, again, a comorbid problem um, that is associated, and they would meet guidelines. But again, as I mentioned, even meeting guidelines does not mean access to the surgery because over 50% of patients who meet criteria do not have coverage through their insurance. In the past, um, we've had quite a few different types of operations to offer. Um, it was sort of a fringe specialty. Uh, the complications with the very malabsorptive operations were clearly um, a, a concern with nutrition. But uh, here at the university and uh, globally, really, um, the two most commonly performed operations are the Roux and Y gastric bypass and the vertical sleeve gastrectomy. They can be split into restrictive type operations, where basically the stomach is made to a smaller volume, so the patients have that satiety with a smaller portion, or a malabsorption where the nutrients are diverted away for certain parts of the intestine, thus allowing for that uh, weight loss. The room wide gastric bypass, again, has a third of someone's total body weight, and that creates that malabsorptive type of mechanism. And the sleeve gastrectomy has more of a restrictive where 80% of someone's stomach is removed completely. So the bypass is, irrever is reversible, excuse me, and the sleeve is irreversible. And so there's a lot of things that I can go into um, about these operations with patients, but just to know that the sleeve is irreversible. A lot of people um, find that it's a, a more preferable operation because they think it's least invasive, but they're both surgeries that do change the size of someone's stomach, but there's just a difference in the malabsorptive properties and mechanisms. 
um, just to run through this briefly, because I know that I think we have to finish up in four minutes, is that correct? <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so with the gastric bypass, the stomach is divided, so it's holding basically 30 cc's volume. Um, it allows for um, that small volume to, again, uh, be re to a lower portion of the intestine, thus diverting nutrients away from the first part of the uh, GI tract. Um, amazing hormonal response, peptide improvement, um, which is why we see the satiety and um, that sustained weight loss. And again, that's a third of someone's total body weight. Um, I already talked about that part, so I'll move through that. The sleeve um, is about 85% of that patient's stomach is removed. Uh, again, creates restriction. Uh, removal of this portion of the stomach does change um, hormone levels, ghrelin, and things. And we see about 25 total body weight loss of somebody um, who has this operation. And it's basically a, a certain size bougie that we place along the lesser curb and then uh, resect that larger portion of the stomach. Um, there's still a lot of GI mechanisms to why surgery works, and I won't go into it, but just to know that there are differences. Um, it's important for patients to have follow-up, not just with surgery, but any sort of um, uh, weight loss, because there's nutritional deficiencies not only seen in surgery, but of course in patients who have obesity. I don't know if anyone saw the most recent story, but there's a teenage boy in England who uh, was only surviving, well not surviving, I'm sorry. He was so picky that he would only eat french fries and Pringles, but he's actually now uh, blind because of vitamin deficiencies from really poor nutrition. And you know, so it's not to say it's the surgery itself, it's not to say it's obesity itself, there's a lot of nutritional information in, in regards to this disease. Um, but with the bypass, there's, there's clear diversion of, of foods which leads to why we see certain nutri uh, deficiencies that should be followed up. And um, real briefly, that osteoporosis, osteopenia can still be seen um, despite weight loss uh, due to many of the mechanisms after metabolic surgeries. Um, there's changes in skeletal load and muscle mass and inflammation that we um, are still yet to, to, to understand. Um, but returning it back to, to my clinic, um, I'm at the uh, weight management metabolic surgery clinic with um, Dr. Kanderwal, Dr. Sher, and Dr. Montour. And we are here to basically um, work with patients to, to understand what are their barriers and how to help address them and maybe get them to that bridge to maybe a different therapy. Um, if you were to um, uh, ask patients to come to us, our website has a seminar. And so that seminar um, is something they should go through so they can have a better understanding to come to their first appointment. Um, we have a multidisciplinary approach with our own social worker, our own dietitian, um, and all the different things so that we can help to uh, work with their primary doctors for this chronic disease. And just in regards to surgery, I think it's a challenge because sometimes when you refer someone, it's sort of a black hole, and it's been like maybe six months, a year. Um, unfortunately, this is not an operation that can be done within a few days or weeks of even referral. They see that seminar, we do a consultation to ensure there's no contraindications such as an eating disorder, untreated depression, um, other things that may um, uh, lead to, to um, uh, blunted outcomes. Uh, they see all of our multidisciplinary team and we tell them that you know if, if, if our social worker feels that this is not a right um, step to go toward, we would not proceed with the surgery. Once many testing are done, we will then um, have the ultimate test review, scheduling, um, and then operation, which can lead to two to six months even before surgery. And as mentioned, with actual weight loss, it takes, again, many months afterwards for them to get to that weight loss goal. Um, I already mentioned it before, access to care is a challenge. There is very limited access to care for obese uh, management. Um, myself and Dr. Kanderwal, who are the surgeons, um, in regards to lifestyle, you know, even with surgery, there's a, a range in how someone will respond. So as you can see, um, you have patients who lose 50% of their total body weight, and you have people who lose only 10% of their total body weight with the same operation, the same 
um, care and clinic. And so it, it's, it's one of those things where it's not just the surgery. They have to really engage in the multidisciplinary lifestyle changes. I guess the only thing is that, you know, no NSAIDs after bypass. That's my, my tiny plug as a bariatric surgeon because if they come and need um, any sort of joint and, and back and orthopedic care, the NSAIDs really do cause um, complications in the bariatric um, anatomy, especially bypass due to marginal ulcers and complications. But thank you again for your time this morning. Sorry. Sorry for going over. Wow, no questions. I think Greg has a question. What is the mortality like after bariatric surgery? I remember learning that it's previously pretty high and the rates changed. It's safer than gallbladder surgery. Yeah, no, I mean, I think technology, uh, uh, the, the fact we have multidisciplinary approach prior to, as well as the um, accreditation program through the American College of Surgeons, there is so much improvement, especially with identification of leaks and potential risk of DVT and bleeding. And laparoscopy, you know, you could do a sleeve in 30 minutes and a bypass in 90. And so patients are on the table for very short times and they're up and moving. They get to be discharged within 24 hours of surgery. So patients are vastly having very safe operations and you should look at it as safer as gallbladder, safer than gallbladder surgery because gallbladder surgery is not elective. They're not being, you know, managed beforehand. Thanks for the talk. Uh, Dr. Fernando, what BMI or any other uh, objective criteria cutoff do you use to offer total hip arthroplasty and is it different between uh, that and total knee arthroplasty? So it's the uh, same BMI cutoff objectively or at least grossly. I think the majority of literature suggests that a BMI greater than 40 increases the risk of infection. So with, with hips in particular, anterior hips in particular, I'll have a more detailed conversation with patients, even with a BMI greater than 30, that my interpretation of the literature is that their risk of infection is higher. It's still somewhat of a gestalt. I'm trying to get uh, Jason to my new PA to make me behave in terms of which patients I think still are appropriate and, and, and inappropriate, but I think uh, it's a combination of body habitus, combination of BMI, combination of nutrition. Um, um, you know, and, and to some extent, I think it may depend on their their overall you know health um, patterns. I think patients you know may have a good appearing thigh. You know, you've all made incisions in in skin, and sometimes that fat is is dense and and healthy looking. In some cases, it's like soup. So obviously, you don't know that until you're in the operating room. But sometimes you get an impression of, of the quality of the skin, and sometimes when you're retracting back the panis, you know, in clinic or in the OR, it starts bleeding already. So that's, I think, also a bad sign. So it's, it's uh, still a combination, I think, of multiple things. On that, too, I think BMI is the worst way to evaluate this disease. Um, I have a patient who's been at 40 and another in the afternoon that's 40, and they are completely different people because of the uh, distribution, you know, the, the, the gynoid versus the android body shape, where android is all metabolic and central obesity versus the gyno was peripheral. And so I think that BMIs is actually quite a, an adequate way of addressing this disease. It's a good question because I'd love to say yes, but it's not always that I've seen that the case. It's not independently my experience, but I would say patients that have had previous gastric bypass surgeries, I think even the patient I mentioned in clinic or in that slide had lost a significant amount of weight, but not in their stomach. Yeah. So when I started my practice, to your point about technical difficulties, I was somewhat more conservative in that 
from a technical perspective, it's also more difficult. They didn't touch on that independently, but the size of the thigh can make acetabular component position more difficult. There's studies that suggest increased antiversion, abduction, femoral delivery is harder to deliver the, the, the thigh, obviously, at a greater distance. So I've, through practice, I suppose, and experience, have less of a concern from a technical perspective. Um, I used to have a cutoff of 35 when I first started. Now, again, from a technical perspective, I don't feel uh, limited, but not everything's in my control, and that's part of the difficulty.